Shara Ali is co-founder of the Greens Climate Action Network, former Green Party deputy leader. Ava Evans is political correspondent at joe.co.uk. And Kate Andrews is economics editor at The Spectator. They are here to answer your questions on any subject that, that you like. We will take questions on Ukraine, obviously, but if you want to ask about something else, you might want to ask about Nazanin Sagari Radcliffe, for instance, just as a hint, 0345 6060 973. And if you've never watched us on Global Player before, I don't know why, because it's brilliant entertainment. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Uh, let's go to our first caller. It's Chris in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Michael Gove said yesterday, I've had it up to here with people trying to suggest this country is not generous when it comes to refugees. Is he right? Um, Ava, I'm going to come to you first because I, I retweeted your clip on joe.co.uk of Michael Gove saying this. It was quite a remarkable performance. I mean, take away the performance. Did you understand his frustration? <sighs> okay. Michael Gove claimed that the hostile environment was created under a Labour government, which is simply not true. It is true. It's not Al true. Alan Johnson. It was under Alan Johnson, and he he was the one that first coined the phrase the hostile environment. He coined environment. the phrase, but well, he was the Home hostile Secretary environment at the time. was put in by Theresa May. No, so it, was, there's a difference it was actually put in by phrase. Alan Johnson. But it wasn't actioned upon, was it? We didn't actually start driving vans around until Theresa May decided that we were going to get all of the uh, migrants out. It's not just about vans, though. I mean, he, he coined the phrase and clearly did it deliberately. And it was then taken over, you're right, by the Conservative government. But actioning it is very different, surely? Well, I don't know what actions he took as Home Secretary. We all know about the vans, but that was actually quite a few years down the line, wasn't it? Sort of 2014, 2015. Well, I mean, I know, I know what actions Theresa May took, and, you know, those were kicking out a load of people who came over here in Windrush to help us out with the NHS. That was quite a, se a severe action, would you not say? Yeah, that actually started under Labour as well. Where? It started in 2004. That was when the first Windrush people were asked to leave the country. But we didn't have targets. Theresa May created targets. She wanted to kick out 20,000 people a year. I mean, that, that's, that's markedly different, but, you know, from coining a phrase. But in terms of... So you think that that... I mean, we're, we're now in 2022. That was sort of six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. We have taken... This government has offered sanctuary to um, over 100,000 people from Hong Kong. They've taken in 15,000 Afghans, Syrian refugees as well. Michael Gove, if he were here, would no doubt say, well, that's proof that we don't have a hostile attitude to people coming to this country. Well, we haven't actually taken in 15,000. I appreciate under Operation Pitting, we, we brought 15,000, we repatriated 15,000 people over here. But 5,000 of those were uh, already British national, sorry, British nationals. But 10,000 of those haven't actually been rehoused. I mean, we've got a scheme where we're going to repatriate people 5,000 a year. But I mean, so 5,000 get housed this year. What are we doing with the other five that came in with Operation Pitting? That, that still feels pretty hostile to me. So you think the hostile environment is continuing now? It's alive and well. Okay, Kate Andrews. Well, I agree. I think the Ukrainian refugees are experiencing the hostile environment even before they get to the UK. If you compare our response to the rest of Europe, where it has been arms open first, documentation second, here in the UK, you have to get a visa to come here. There are, uh, despite what Priti Patel said, many Ukrainian refugees who are being turned around when they try to access the UK. And look, to, to Michael's question, whether or not the government cares about these refugees. I can't speak to what's in their heart. I'm sure many, many members of the government and the Tory party do. It's the policy that I can weigh up. And the policy isn't good enough. The policy completely puts the onus on what, you know, let's say are extremely generous British indiv individuals by the thousands who are planning on opening up their homes to British refugees. But this idea that you have to find a sponsor, you have to market yourself to people in the UK to be able to come to this country, you should be able to show... Well, that's, that's not how it's going to work, is it? <laughs> it is how no, it's it going no, to it work. No, it isn't. If the you... charities will have lists and they will match them up with why people who've offered we, their accommodation. Why are we putting this on the charities and why are we putting Ukrainians well, well, in a position where... Well, how do you where... do it? So, so when I was in Calais last week speaking to Ukrainian refugees, who were trying to come to London. And there, by the way, there are no British officials there. There were only charities. You are putting these Ukrainians in a situation where they've already been 
to hell and back, in which they are now having to try to convince these charity workers to prioritise them at the top of the list to get How here. would you do it then? Loads of them. I would say if you show up at a train station in Paris... If you show up at an airport anywhere in Europe and you have a Ukrainian passport, that is proof at the moment you're a refugee. No, I agree with we that. We have all in, seen the videos. We know terms, you're a refugee. You don't matching, need a visa. In terms of matching them to families in the, in this country, there's got, there's got to be some system. I mean, you can't just have... I mean, in Berlin... German people were arriving at the train station and holding up placards saying, I can take four yeah, people. And, and we're not going to do that, are not, we? Can I say, dare I say that's working? I don't think that's the ideal system, by the way, Anne. I have no problem with the government trying to create a system to match refugees to, to, to host. I, I don't have an issue with that. I do have an issue with this idea that we will only help you if you manage to get somebody in the UK to vouch for you. In Berlin, people are showing up at train stations and they're saying, I can host you for six weeks. And by the way, I'm someone, for example, who I actually don't know in six months if I could host somebody, but I could certainly host somebody for the next six weeks. And people need beds. They need blankets for the next six weeks. Mm. We need to put the humanitarian aid first and the paperwork okay. second. And, and very, very quickly, this government has decided on this scheme, I believe, to keep numbers down. And they've put Ukrainians and their needs second. And frankly, compared to the rest of Europe, I think it's despicable. Tobias Elwood, that's quite an accusation to make. Um, I don't know what your view is on the... I mean, let's, let's first of all go back to the question about Michael Gove. He says he's had it up to here with people saying the government don't care about refugees. I think you've been to Ukraine recently, haven't you? I mean, is he right? I, I think we were slow in getting a system in place. I think that's, that's fair. And you go back to Afghanistan as well. It took us a while. The Arab scheme even isn't today isn't working as well as it should do. And we've had problems in, in making that happen. We need to have that skill set in, whether it be the Home Office, indeed the, the MOD is, is probably the best at this because they have greater training in you know, horizon scanning, seeing what the problems are, creating a solution and actually executing that. What we have seen both with Afghanistan and indeed Ukraine is a time delay between us getting around the table, working out what can actually happen, and then putting it to place. What do you put that wish, down to? Well, I'm, I'm afraid it goes to the, the, the number 10, uh, having a, a grasp of what's coming over the horizon. We were aware that there was going to be a refugee you know, crisis potentially months ago. I, you know, I was saying there was going to be an invasion months ago. Now, people didn't necessarily believe me. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I did. they did or not. Yeah, <laughs> the point, though, is that there should be a, 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 you know, a red team in each department that's looking at this to say it could happen. And if it does happen, what, what are our plans? And so we should then be prepared for this. We were, when compared, compared with other continental uh, uh, European countries, uh, looking like we're very slow to, to catch up to But, but the point is... We have now got, I should say, a system in place which is starting... To, uh, to to cement itself, taking advantage of the British generosity, and I hope will that, that will now work. Don't forget that in the case of the Ukraine, it is different to Afghanistan because you're mostly dealing with women and children. The men are obliged to stay back and fight. Therefore, I agree, there should have been a, 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 a an expedited pro program to be able to come here to be able to make sure that we can get them in and look but after also, them in a way, rather than having it, to go through the usual checks and balances it that you wasn't, do for fear of perhaps introducing terrorists into this country. It wasn't just you and I that were warning about an invasion. Lots of other people were. I mean, a lot of military and defence commentators say, oh, no, 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 it's not going to happen. Putin's right. never going to do it. But there are enough people saying that it was going to happen for the Home Office, surely, at least six months ago, to have started to prepare for this eventuality and clearly nobody did now that's a failure not just of the civil service but political leadership as well isn't it and if your political leadership is not going to consider those and task units inside whitehall departments to make the initial planning to do the assumptions to provide the information for the politicians to make their judgments suddenly it all has to happen after the event has taken place and mm. that's i'm afraid what happens too often okay. and that's the number 10 mindset i'm afraid that i hope we now realize we're in a different world now because of ukraine we need to get better at this shara ali i think we do need to take a step back avoid being party political for the sake of it let's appeal to people's better natures it's unquestionable and undeniable, unfortunately, that this current administration has been pursuing a hostile environment. Well, that didn't last long, did it? You say, let's not play politics, right. and then you immediately go and do so. At this time, <laughs> we must overcome that. But just to give an example of that hostility, turning back boats in the Channel, potentially in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights, that's not a good policy. But I do think now is the opportunity to overcome this. As Kate has said, what we must do is recognise that we are talking about human individual people fleeing for their lives, 
broken from their families and they want to return to the Ukraine. That's the objective. And in the meantime, we need to make things as simple and seamless as possible. It has become a bureaucratic problem. I've no objection to charities getting involved. And why is that? Because they have a track record, better than politicians, to put actions before words. We must avoid the situation. It, it's, it's not a matchmaking exercise as such. It's a question about resources. We have a lot of volunteers, and I do believe that there is a great British pride in helping, and there's a track record of that. Let's make sure that we can match the vacancies that people are putting up to the numbers. And that's the number one requirement. Because we are dealing... The other problem here is that attention has shifted away from the cause of this humanitarian crisis to dealing with the humanitarian crisis. And there is a risk in that, because we are not dealing with the root problem. But well, we know the root problem. It's Vladimir Putin's invasion. How, how, Let's not how, how much more difficult does it get? Attention away from dealing with that, which we're failing to do adequately. There are a number of things that we should be doing, which we are not at the moment. Like, like what? Well, Putin's revenues, 60% of that is through the petrochemical industry. Mm. And at last count, we have 65 oil tankers heading to destinations around the world and the West and the US. They should be held back, stopped from boarding, that would really hurt the I mean, finances of you're, this you're, you're right, but it's not as simple as that, is it? Because, it, I mean, Germany, for example, we know about 49% of its gas needs come from Russia. Now, you, you could say, well, they should just turn off the taps, turn off the pipeline immediately, but how would Germany cope with that? You might think, well, it's a rich country, does further, it really matter? Further and faster and with greater resolve than we're doing now. What's the comparison here? The comparison is between people carrying on business as usual, watching and waiting to see what happens next, and people who are fleeing for their lives, and people who are dying. All right, let's on the let's edge put of that to, to the rest, rest of the panel. Do you think? I mean, I would. I think the international response to this has been far more united and far more far stronger than I would probably have predicted uh, at the outset. Um, Shah is not very happy with some of it. Um, Ava, what, what do you think? Do you think that could, more could have been done? Well, I actually think that's why it's problematic. I, I was in Calais last Thursday. You've all been to Calais. Well, <laughs> I've been in Calais quite a lot over the past year and what you find over there is there are a lot of Afghans, there are a lot of Kurdish people living in all, like tents in absolutely awful fields that are full of mud. The smell of these places... But the is, Ukrainians are being put up in hotels, they, I understand. Exactly that. They're being put up in hostels and hotels and they're welcomed by the, the, the people of Calais. The mayor of Calais has been down there handing out donations and, you know... You go and visit the hostel, it's, it's, it's pretty okay, it's a pretty okay response. And then you head down to these tents mm. and you find people eating out of canned tomatoes that are roasting over like an open fire. It, it's totally abysmal. I mean, I saw President Macron having a go at Britain for its response to refugees. And I was thinking, well, hang on a minute, mate. It's, it's you that is treating the Afghans and the Syrians in, in such a terrible way in these camps at Calais. And okay, you're putting up Ukrainians, but... I mean, that, that feeds into this narrative that it, it's one rule for white, blonde Europeans and, a, and another rule um, if you are of brown skin, isn't it, Kate? I have a lot of sympathy for that point, and I think there's a lot of truth to it for many people. I also think you can argue, I think multiple things can be true at the same time. Um, I think it can certainly be the case that, generally speaking, um, people are playing into you know, certain stereotypes that we would all actually really like to reject and they're more comfortable with Ukrainian refugees for that reason. I also think at the same time you can make the point that this is a very particular situation in which it's extremely clear cut what has happened. Russia has invaded a democratic, sovereign nation. It is shelling apartment buildings, as we've mentioned before, roughly, what is it, over 80% of the refugees are women and children. You don't often get situations that are as clear cut as that. So I don't think it's so simple as to say that it's fundamentally a race issue. But I do not dispute for a moment that race is a big factor here. And I've been very critical of our so-called refugee system within the Home Office for many years, because um, 
it, it has treated ethnic minorities and people coming from other areas absolutely appallingly. But I don't think that should be a reason that we say downgrade our response to the Ukrainian refugees. It should be a moment of reflection as mm. to why we haven't been well, kinder to other people. Tobias, let me bring in a text from Sarah in Manchester here. She says 1.4 million refugees fled Syria. Why has the response to this refugee crisis been so different? So it, we've uh, had a problem with interventions uh, in the last couple of decades where we've not had the strategic patience to solve the solution. And Syria is one example of that. Iraq is another. Afghanistan to some degree as well. 20 years that we're there, we didn't find the solutions that were required even before we then gave up and, and, and turned away. But Somalia is another place. I've served in some of these places. And unfortunately, we then depart, uh, don't ensure that there's an indigenous capability to look after governance and security. The situation deteriorates. And then individuals, families, make the very tough decision to turn their backs on their own country, seeking a safer life somewhere else. And they end up making their way to Europe, some of which end up in, in Calais as well. Now, we then say, OK, we're going to have tougher border controls in Dover. We're even going to bring in the Navy to do this, which is just not what the nation should be mm -hmm. used for. But the point, though, is, is that we don't have the, uh, the commitment to make sure that places like Libya are looked after, to make sure that they are, can stand on their feet before we then depart. If we're going to do an I mean, intervention... L Libya was a bit different, though, wasn't it? Because the, Libya, well, the, the, the supposed Libyan government at the time, I think there were actually two of them, they said, no, no, we want to do this on our own. And we never had boots on the ground in, in Libya. So they actually said, we don't want you to do this. So you, you're, you're absolutely right to say we don't have boots on the ground, but this is my world. Post-conflict reconstruction, peacekeeping, nation-building. This is what we need to get better at. We're very good at defeating the enemy killing the bad people mm. then i'm afraid like a baseball game saying we won and then walking away leaving it from afraid this is charlie wilson's war that's what happened there you need to invest in the country itself and from there can come all sorts of good things from a trade prosperity perspective as well but if you simply depart and leave it for them you know to operate now of course you need to be conscious of the fact that there were two governments but they needed to they both recognized that they couldn't do it on their own Libya is one case, but you go around, you know, Africa, the Horn of Africa, there are other localities, Iraq, uh, Syria as well, for example. Yemen is another way where we've just watched what's going on from afar, and then you wonder why there are refugees wanting to come or asylum seekers wanting to come. And if we solve these problems with a little more effort, then these fires could be put out at source rather than them allowing to conflate at the moment, and now they become deluged, and then we wonder why they queue up in places like Calais wanting to come to the UK. OK, 0345 6060 Remember, you can watch us on Global Player. More of your calls in just a moment. It's 18 minutes past eight. LBC. I'm sorry.
question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 21 minutes past eight on LBC. You're listening to or watching Cross Question. We have our panel in the studio, Kate Andrews from The Spectator, Tobias Elwood, Chairman of the Defence Select Committee, Shara Ali, former Deputy Leader of the Green Party, and Ava Evans, political correspondent at joe.co.uk. Let's go to John in Inverness. Hello, John. Well, hi, Ian. Thanks for taking hi. my call. Uh, my question for you and the panel is basically, how, do you, how would you consider Margaret Thatcher would have reacted had she been around and been PM right now, I rather suspect um, she would have been trying to persuade Biden to take a diff- totally different view to what he has and would have tried to consider driving the Russians out of Ukraine with military action. Well, I think she would have probably Joe Biden told Joe Biden not to go wobbly like she did to George H. W. Bush <laughs> just before just when um, Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Uh, Tobias, let's come to you first. Yeah, it's a really good question. We came up today at our uh, Defence Select Committee hearing with Lord Robertson uh, as to how important that special relationship is in dealing with what's going on in the world. We tend to lean to the United States for Western leadership when it's coming into dealing with problems like this. And, and I hope the penny has now dropped, that this is not just about Ukraine, but this is now game-changing. We moved into a new era of history, uh, given European security, with a potential alliance developing between Russia and China. And we need to come to terms with that. It's critical, therefore, for the United States to lean into this. But there's already a hesitance here. We've done incredibly well on the sanctions, which we touched on earlier. That really has galvanized uh, an effort to isolate Putin himself. Even the Russian people realize that uh, there is no future for them to return to the international stage with him in charge. But they won't get, get rid of him immediately. And the pain he can in, uh, inflict on Ukraine is going to be phenomenal uh, until that moment. So how does the West respond? It's critical that uh, Britain and America works together. And if we are seeing America hesitate in any form whatsoever, then it is us to step forward, as we've done in the past with our continental allies. And this is the interesting thing as to whether there's now a new approach that perhaps Russia, sorry, that uh, Britain, France and Germany, with Germany's renewed uh, sort of investment into uh, its own foreign policy and defence spending as well, can look at continental European security to say, can we, uh, uh, you know, can we make this happen? But I'm dismayed by Biden. I have to say, I'm dual national. I was born in the United States. Um, I expected more from him on the leadership side. But for him to say that, uh, from this perspective, that uh, any decision to utilize NATO, this incredible uh, force that we have, this alliance, the one thing that Putin is concerned about, would immediately escalate to World War III. That is a uh, to trivialize the, uh, the, the, what we could do in response incrementally in recognizing that there, there is uh, that ratcheting ladder that we need to make sure avoids taking us into the space where uh, either chemical or nuclear weapons might be utilized. Sharon. I mean, I think this is a... John, thank you for your question. It's a useful exercise, hypothetical question. I mean, I, I met Margaret Thatcher, must have been about 20 years ago now, and I found that her intuitions and her beliefs didn't really match how she was being presented in the public as a Hayekian. And I think that's... She was the first one to talk about climate change, right. wasn't she? Can, it can happen. Yeah. It absolutely can happen. I mean, Trump, um, you know, in, in, the, in the first few days did contend that this wouldn't have happened on his watch. And up to a point, he might be right, because it might take another despotic testosterone fueled narcissist to be able to contend with and think like, um, <laughs> the, you know, Putin at this point. Um, but that's not going to be stable on anybody's front. I mean, I'm instinctively a, a pacifist, right? So I, but not an absolute pacifist, right? I mean, there's a term, you know, coined by a political philosopher actually called pacificism. And the idea is, is that you will assert yourself using violence, justified violence, if you are existentially under threat And Biden has already announced a red line, but that red line is arguably not where it should be. It was, if there is an encroachment on European soil, we will then wade in. But the Ukrainians, are they have every right to feel betrayed because they already are taking the heat and withstanding the shelling on an hour-by-hour, day-by-day basis. Why should our prime minister be announcing, for example, there's a propaganda war as well, if you hadn't noticed. What you don't do as a military tactician is announce the fact that a no-fly zone is out of the question. I don't understand why we would do that. 
The whole point of mutually assured destruction, again, of course, is calling one's bluff and pretending that you will use that deterrent, even though it will be a crime against humanity, even just to say that you would be prepared to. What we mustn't do, we've got... Oh, you're you're not, not sounding very much like a pacifist, if Boris I may say so. The point... Well, the thing is, unless you are prepared to use force where necessary, mm. then... You will just be you will just be ridden roughshod over. We've got to assert, and we've got to stop saying that we cannot risk triggering an escalation because we are actually heading towards escalation territory by default. That's what happens with these situations. They escalate. History has shown us time and again. And I think Margaret Thatcher could have uttered virtually every word of what you've just said there, which is a Maybe. tribute. But believe me, coming from me, that's a tribute. But <laughs> Thank you. But um, Kate Andrews, using what think it, or saying what would Margaret Thatcher do in this situ situation? That's quite a good rule of thumb, isn't it, to start any conversation? Uh, many, many conversations, perhaps. Um, I'm going to politely disagree with these first two panelists' comments, and I'll try to frame it in terms of John's question. A lot of people have been saying, "Is this Boris Johnson's Falklands moment?" The difference, obviously, being nuclear capability. And this completely changes the game. I don't know what Margaret Thatcher would have done because she was not presented in the same way with that same situation. And I actually think that Biden's done a pretty decent job so far. Um, it is, you speak to German commentators or German correspondents, the idea that Germany would be rearming itself, uniting with the West in the way it's done, refusing to certify Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline, um, trying as soon as it can to abandon its serious dependency on Russian energy, Russian gas, um, is miles away from where we were six weeks ago. This is a completely reformed position for the country. That is a huge win, I would say, for actually Joe Biden's leadership and something that he wanted to achieve. Um, why are we still ruling out no-fly zones? Because it would escalate the situation, not in a gradual way, um, n not in a step-by-step -step way, but because if, if the Brits, if the Americans, if the Germans, if the Europeans start cooperating to shoot down Russian planes, we are in completely uncharted territory with countries that have nuclear capability. This is the fundamental difference. I don't pretend to be an expert on the situation, but when I look at the united response in such a short period of time, so far away from where we were six weeks ago, between the US, the UK, and the rest of Europe. Do I think there's more we could do? Yes, especially when it comes to sanctioning individuals and Russian oligarchs, but I actually think it's been pretty darn impressive. Tobias, you wanted to come back. Well, it's this international international statecraft, which I think leads us to you know, to Margaret Thatcher. That's what I would seek. That's what I want right now. That's what is is required. And if you show any form of timidity, if you are risk averse, then Putin will take advantage of that. Now, put in context, uh, no fly zone is a tactical option. And it needs to fit into what is your strategic direction that you want to go. What is it that a nuclear fly, uh, no fly zone will actually then achieve? And if you need to answer that second part before you do the first part, it could be that you might consider it, but you certainly don't declare that you're not going to do it. You keep yes. your cards close to your chest. That's what I didn't understand. And the more plausible uh, event that they could have supported, which was on the table, which didn't even need to be organized by the Americans, was the Polish MiG-29s that could have been slid across the table quite quietly to the Ukrainian Air Force. They requested it, and that was turned down for the very same reason. This knee-jerk reaction that anything we do that might seem hostile might lead to then Can World I challenge War challenge that just a little bit, though, right? If circumstances change, as frankly they have over the past six weeks for Germany, radically so, you can see a country change its position. But don't you think that the right default is one in which we say we do not want nuclear war? Uh, it, it strikes me that, like, your point is, if there were any situation that has changed, we've taken this off the table. Well, if, you know, the most monumental thing changed, theoretically they could put it back on the table. But I think it's quite right that you have Biden and you have Boris and, and you have Europe saying, we want to avoid nuclear war and the actions that might suggest that we're uh, leaning in are, that direction at position. every cost. Yeah, these are default positions that you want to avoid nuclear war. But they're also they don't want to use rhetoric that would in any way no, I'm imply. I'm not even talking about rhetoric. Any way I'm imply that about 
about strategy it. and then tactical options which can actually help Ukrainians who are dying in their thousands, who have cities being surrounded, who are having their, their infrastructure pulverized and chemical weapons, you know, potentially going to be used on them as well. It's and we horrifying. are watching from afar saying, what shall we do? Yeah, and but, this is but the it, timid it, approach. If we're the, now just moving from defensive weapon systems like end laws, you know, to, to, to uh, other more offensive weapon systems. But it's very, very slow progress. We are learning. We are gaining more confidence and so forth. But we should have greater self-confidence in standing up. We need these Cold War statecraft skills that, you know, did us well for but when the Cold all War of itself. The, and at when the moment, all, we've had two, two, three, 30 years of peace and we need to move out of that okay. mindset. But when, when you have the different war gaming scenarios that have apparently been done in Washington, they've war gamed all of these things, you, you enforce a no-fly zone, what happens next? And the result of every one of these scenarios, I'm told by Ben Judo, you, you will know him, he was yeah. on the programme last week, I'm told that the result of every one of these different scenarios was Putin using nuclear weapons. Now, you, you've got to be a fairly brave politician to play brinkmanship in, the, in those circumstances. So I'm not advocating a no-fly zone. I'm saying do not tell your adversary, no general blurts okay. out what you're not going to do. I am saying that the MiG-29s was an example of what you could do, but we still ruled it out. Ava is very keen to talk about Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Look, I, I, I it's like a, a great too. eye roll for listeners. No, I was just thinking maybe she'll, uh, maybe she would have taken away his milk. I don't know. Excellent. Right, we will take more of your calls in a moment. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. That was when I became a Thatcherite when she did that because I hated school milk when I was at primary school. It's eight thirty three. Andy Ivy has the news headlines. A Ukrainian official says an estimated 20,000 civilians have fled the besieged city of Mariupol in a convoy of cars via a humanitarian corridor, but reports say aid lorries are unable to get in and it's claimed Russian forces are holding 400 civilians at a hospital. Elsewhere, the capital Kiev is under curfew until Thursday morning after further Russian missile strikes that killed at least five people. The leaders of Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia have travelled by train to the city on a European Union mission to show support for the country. A Russian journalist who protested against the invasion live on state TV has been fined just over £200. Speaking outside court in Moscow, she said she had to take a stand against the Kremlin. LBC weather, rain in Scotland overnight, cloudy elsewhere. Tomorrow, a largely dry start before rain arrives, a high of 13 degrees. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's 8.37. With me in the studio answering your questions are Ava Evans, political correspondent at joe.co.uk, Dr Shara Ali, former deputy leader of the Green Party, Tobias Elwood, chairman of the Defence Select Committee, and Kate Andrews, economics editor at The Spectator. Let's go to your next question. It's from David in Victoria. Hi, David. Hello, good evening. Um, I don't understand how we can do any deal with Putin if he's, a, if he's a war criminal. It doesn't make any sense to me. You had people calling in before cross-question suggesting that, and plus the uh, Ukrainians are already negotiating. I mean, it seems crazy. Good question, isn't it, Kate? Yeah, it's um, hard to wrap your mind around. It's um, obviously not an ideal outcome to give Putin anything that he might want. I think you have to take the utilitarian uh, approach to this and ask how do we stop tens, hundreds, thousands of innocent people in Ukraine from Putin shelling and from him setting his army upon innocent people. Um, and I think the the more Putin does, the more aggressive he gets, the harder it is to do a deal. Um, and certainly the, the harder it is to, to come to the negotiating table. But the reason that the Ukrainians are there negotiating is because they want the pain, the aggression and the war to stop. Um, you know, it's it's not pretty. It's not nice. Nobody's sitting around happy about the idea of figuring out how we might find a solution that gives Putin any kind of smile. Um, but at, and and then the other point I would make is that it's very difficult now, even if the Ukrainians and, and the Russians come to any kind of deal, to think that we're going back to the way things were before. I mean, Europe has decided that it wants to no longer be dependent on Russian gas. The idea that all sanctions are going to lift tomorrow if Putin sends his army's home is, is for the birds. We have fundamentally changed our perspective on Russia and frankly, I think, on other countries like China, which are committing genocide as we speak against the Uyghur Muslims um, and this idea that you can negotiate reasonably with aggressive powers. I think a lot's going to change. Uh, Russia and, and what Putin has done to the Russian people, many are who are protesting, risking jail time uh, because they're so disturbed at what their dictator is doing. Um, their lives are going to be significantly worse off for a long time. So it's not so simple as to say that Russians go home happy. Nobody goes home happy. But the major goal at the moment is to get the shelling to stop. And from that angle, I think you have to take utilitarian perspective. It's interesting what you said about ending sanctions, because it's quite difficult to imagine that these sanctions can end while Putin is still leading Russia. Yeah. But maybe that's a discussion for another day. Um, Ava, Dominic Raab, the Justice Secretary, was at The Hague this week talking about war crimes uh, and Putin. Now, as I understand it, that the process for convicting someone of war crimes, it's, it's not a quick thing. So um, it could be a situation where not just Ukraine, but other countries are negotiating with Putin while he's being indicted in The Hague. Can you imagine that scenario? Well, I, I haven't seen it in my lifetime. We're still waiting on Iraq. A controversial comment. Um, You're not suggesting that our dear former leader should be before The Hague, are you? I'm not suggesting that it would be a terrible idea. Uh, it might be a good idea. Um, Look, the thing about Putin is we don't want to set a precedent that you can invade a country and then everything's going to be all right afterwards. Otherwise, we're getting into the realm of Hitler and the Sudetenland in, you know, 38. I think what's really interesting, what Kate said, is that this is actually going to change the way that we view Russia from here on out. And I actually don't think it's terrible that we're not going to depend on Russia for, you know, certain oil or gas potentially after the end of this year. I think that's great that we're not going to depend on that regime. I think it also, what would be a really good learning curve for us is not to look to other regimes to get our oil. So That's the problem though, isn't it? Because if you look at all of the oil producing countries, and we can go right around the world, and I'm not sure I can immediately think of one where you think, hey, that's a country that we really want to do business with, most of them. The um, US. Are, do we actually import any oil no, no, from the but US? That's the, but that, that may be... Um, I, they don't allow... No, no, I know. The, the, the US is a nightmare on this stuff. But, I mean, you look but at Venezuela, there is a country I mean, that Nigeria could be has its own sort of problems. Well, and sure, but we Saudi can't, Arabia, we obviously. Why are we talking about oil and gas all the time? Why can't well, we, we need be it. constructively talking about renewables? If we're taking a fifth of our energy at the moment. It's coming from wind. Why can't we look constructively over the next couple of decades about moving completely to renewables? Well, well, we well, can, I think, but it's I, not I think consistent. we are. I mean, we are, but you can't have 100%. I mean, 
mean, we know what happens when you have a total reliability on one energy source. And sure. we, we've got this wrong. Germany's certainly got it wrong in ditching nuclear power. Um, you want to ha surely have a, a basket of energy supplies. Well, then why aren't we looking into nuclear? There have been so many plans for that. I know, it's been a know. failure of successive governments not to plan, plan for that. I totally agree. Sharon? Well, just on the energy, before we come back to the war criminal aspect, um, this is a good opportunity for us to focus mind on another crisis hurtling around the tracks, the climate emergency. We need to stop using fossil fuels right now. One reason... Right now? That, yes, absolutely. Day before yesterday. It's, but that, you see, this is where the Greens go wrong, isn't it? Because that's side. totally unrealistic. What is, what, is unreal, what is realistic, right, around us knowing the facts of the climate emergency and continuing to do nothing? We're not continuing we to, to do nothing. What's politically possible to do, what's scientifically necessary. And it's scientifically necessary that we stop digging fossil fuels. And we shouldn't be substituting for oil and gas imports our own fossil fuel industry, like shale. That is not an option. We should be insulating housing. Okay. One third... Well, well that, that's not the question, okay. is it? It's but about uh, how do we deal with Putin if he's a war criminal? It's, of course, it's a difficult question. It's very hard to know how to deal when, when you are facing shelling on a daily basis. So I would accept negotiation every time, in addition to the prospect and threat of the use of violent force when necessary, we must maintain, and Zelensky has been brilliant at this, back channels, negotiation. Yes, of course it might result in some kind of humiliation, but that humiliation at that point You mean like time, with Macron? Better than, better than certain death if this continues. This could be a very protracted war, violent conflagration. Well, I mean, that, and that's that, why energy is so important. That that's is... one of our main means of stopping his financing of his war in its tracks. Nuclear also not an option. I mean, if this wasn't the best advertisement of all places, you know, where Chernobyl happened, for avoiding nuclear like the plague, because it is also a security threat and risk for generations, even after it's, we've completed the service of... OK, so, so you've ruled... I, I mean, I know we keep going back to energy, yes, but it's Ava's fault. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, so we're, we're ditching uh, coal, we're ditching oil, we're ditching gas, and we're ditching nuclear. I see what you're doing there. But it's impossible. But have... It's impossible in the short term to transfer everything to renewables. It's, it's just it's impossible. Not, it's not impossible. It is it's impossible. scientifically possible. We have technology. We could not, solar, no, solar we could not run our economy from tomorrow by ditching everything apart from renewables. People you know that as well as I do. Well, they like nuclear. People in your party have advocated it, for getting into nuclear. Hard, George Monliot likes it. It's a hard, practical necessity that we need to actually resolve but we simply cannot carry on as we are doing, digging fossil fuels, well, burning them like there's no cre tomorrow. Credit to you for weaving in energy into a question on more criminals. Tobias, let's come back to the question. I think you need to ask yourself, what is Putin trying to achieve here? And we've not really focused on that. What is his long-term objective? And I, he, this is a person that was made to uh, subsidise his KGB salary when the Berlin Wall fell by being a taxi driver. He is angry. Is Yes. So he is angry with the West. He's looking for his own legacy. Where it ties into energy is the fact that his trump card is oil and gas. He recognizes that. And, but he also doesn't like the idea that the EU and NATO will be rubbing up against Russia. So his long-term strategy, and he, along with China, think in decades. We're not very good at doing that. He wants to pivot uh, Russia from looking West to looking East. Because China will quite gladly mop up any oil and gas deals that we tend, we're going to sort of cut away from them. They won't agree to these climate change deals, uh, China will. They're looking for, you know, for the next 30, 40 years. And that will then supplement and support Russia. They both have a dislike of the West. They uh, disdain of, of America running the rules-based order. So it's this wider alliance that we need to be concerned about, which is why this is a turning point in our history. And that then begs the question, coming back, is then how do you hold him to account? I do believe that he will end up either dead or in The Hague one way or another, because the Russian people, as I alluded to before, are recognising where the Russian country is being taken and they no longer want to prove. But as long as China is there supporting him as that backstop, then I'm afraid he will continue. And that brings us then as to fact that it's quite curious as to how we're saying we've got to stop the bombing, the artillery shells and the, and the aeroplanes, but we're still not willing to unleash you know, some capability from NATO to do so.
Tony, in, uh, Tony has emailed me to say, the warmonger you have with you, that's you, Shara, by the way, <laughs> right. needs to get back in his box. I never thought so, I'd have a green politician yeah, on this programme yeah, could be called a warmonger. Briefly, um, you know, I, I, I um, am inspired by the non-violent direct activists of past ages. Gandhi was one. He would have been advocating. And we've seen it. We've seen this. We've seen that Russian soldiers have been unable to mow down women who have been presenting themselves as a physical obstacle in true non-violent direction mode. That's identical to a situation described by Gandhi when women... You're rowing back now, aren't you? <laughs> Lathi charges, yeah, in Peshawar presented a physical obstacle. So these are the inspiring acts. What we could be doing is all of us converging, not as soldiers, all of us converging in Ukraine and presenting a physical obstacle, not for Putin, but the soldiers themselves. That would show real okay. results. Right, we need to move on because we've got a, a question not on Ukraine coming up next. It's 847. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Privilege to speak with Guy Verhofstadt. He was the European Parliament Brexit coordinator and chaired the Brexit steering group. I have seen the figures of refugees. 4,000 visas is the only country in the European Union who is still asking for visa to an Ukrainian refugee. What you're saying is we are consumed by red tape. Exactly. It's, it's crazy that you have red tape uh, when there is such a refugee crisis. For once, the European Union on this was uh, a good example. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 
8.51 is the time on LBC. Kate Andrews, Tobias Elwood, Shara Ali and Ava Evans answering your questions. We have a text from, my goodness, Larnaca in Cyprus. It's Janice. She says, I've long thought Boris Johnson should have received more criticism over the Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe case. If she's now freed under his premiership, will this make up for his previous mistake? I suppose we should uh, say his previous mistake was giving evidence to a select committee when he was foreign secretary and giving totally uh, false answers about uh, her reasons for being in Iran. Tobias Elwood. Yeah, I was based in Lanaka, I see, so hello, it's, uh, <laughs> when I was a soldier. I, I, we're only picking up bits of news here as to what's going on, and uh, it, I would be delighted to learn that this is perhaps the prelude mm. to Nazanin being released because she's been there so many years, but there's been so many false flags here, uh, and sorry, false dawns in that sense, and uh, us thinking that she's going to be uh, be released. It's been tied up also with these uh, chieftain tanks uh, that we sold to uh, Iran before the revolution itself. The tanks never made it. We took the money. We then actually sold those very same chieftain tanks to the Iraqis, believe it or not. Uh, that's another story. Whether we've paid this bill now, and that's then led to this, I don't know. I, hope, I certainly hope... Well, the Iranians we, say we have. In which case, I'm pleased with that, because I asked the very question, why have not we... Still, but why didn't we do it four years ago? Uh, the f different reasons were made, partly because it ran into US sanctions to deal with existing sanctions, which meant that you couldn't... It's actually an arms deal, if you think about it. You're paying for, <laughs> you know, for, for doing your weapons mm. trade, and uh, therefore illegal as such. But there could have been ways around this. I hope that the, the, this has been solved and this will be uh, the beginning of some good news, but um, uh, we'll have to wait to see. OK, I'm going to ask for brief answers on this because then we can squeeze another one in. Kate? Um, to Janice's question, I would, I would ask, has he ever been punished for that mistake? Uh, you know, this is a man who got to resign over Brexit, who has become prime minister. Um, scandal after scandal, whether it be a very expensive receipt for wallpaper or parties in Downing Street when the rest of us were told to stay at home and not see any loved ones, seemed to roll off his back. Um, and, you know, granted, I do think that Partygate stuff will be back in the news, but he has a remarkable ability to avoid consequence for his mistakes. Sure. I mean, to some extent, we're treading on eggshells here. We've got to do, you had a great guest, the, the council, uh, the QC. Um, what we've got to avoid is counting our chickens to the hatch. And we've mm. all got this glimmer of hope. It's a great hope. We can't rest until she's back. I mean, just the thought. I mean, I have uh, children of around that age, but a seven-year-old who has barely, hardly ever seen their mother, that is just indescribable torture, almost. And I'm reminded of the time when, you know, I was campaigning for Guantanamo detainees to be returned home, uh, Mozambique, Sheikh Arma, and we did not rest until they were back on soil. And that's the same attitude, alas, we have to adopt in this case. Ava? Well, I think I agree with Kay. I think he's the Teflon Prime Minister. So I think the public will forgive him and he'll probably be lauded as some sort of saviour for bringing Nazanin back and will totally forget that he was the one who got her imprisoned for an extra year. OK. Right, let's take another question from Shabnam in Cheltenham. The head of the police watchdog has today suggested extramarital affairs should be among dangerous red flags considered by police forces when vetting recruits. Have any of you had an... No, I won't ask that. Um, <laughs> is, is there any merit to this idea? Um, Shara, let's start with you. I mean, there's an interesting implication in this question, is that somehow your personal life should mirror your professional life and that whatever standards you should be held to in your family life or whatever pre whatever misdemeanor you might get up to will carry through into your professional life. Now, frankly, the police have been having, justifiably, a hard time, um, especially since the Everard case, and we've just seen a whole mountain of evidence of misogyny, of racism, and, of course, we've had um, somebody who's been forced to go because of that. So they do have a problem with prejudice institutionalised prejudice within the police force. But that is different. That is different from how people manage their personal, private lives. What they have to be doing better is vetting. They must ensure, even before we get to that stage of whether somebody is a morally decent person and what you can infer from that, we have to ensure that we are not harbouring criminals within the police force itself. That's what we need to be extra vigilant about, and that's where the police are failing. But this, as far as I'm concerned, is a distraction. 
There is, you know, you cannot draw that inference as such. OK. Um, I mean, in the end, it's a matter of trust, isn't it, I suppose? And it's the same with politicians. If a politician has an affair, you say, well, uh, we want to be able to look up to politicians. They should be trusted. It's a bit the same with police officers, I suppose. I mean, if I had an affair, would it affect my ability to do my job as a radio presenter? I would like to think not. But is it different for police officers, Ava? I think a lot of the advocates for this today were saying that it's a good mark of character if you've had an affair or not. But actually, I think if you're looking at sort of domestic abuse, and a lot of police officers are having to go into people's homes and deal with domestic abuse cases, people who abuse their partners typically stay married to them. So you could be accidentally missing out a whole load of abusers if you're just vetting people who had an affair. You're totally missing the cohort of people who are still keeping their abused partner under shackle and chain. I suppose it, it, it is difficult, isn't it? Because I, I don't know what the rest of this report said. It may have made reference to misogyny. It may have made reference to racism. But the one that everybody's talking about is this extramarital affair thing, which on the, when I first read this, I thought, no, that can't be true. And then I read it was the actual chief inspector who said this. Uh, it's bizarre. I mean, we're going to be talking about this after nine, by the way, so I'm sure our listeners will have a view on this. Kate? Um, I think Ava makes a very good point that it's a weird thing to single out, um, as if this is the way that you define character. There are many things that define character. You can think that having an extramarital affair is, is a horrible thing to do to your family. But um, we do not want to live in a society with a social credit system. We do not want to live in a society where um, people have the right to judge what you do that's legal behind closed doors. Uh, and the idea that that could affect what kind of job you get, how high up you get to advance in the police force or any other job is a very, very worrying one indeed. Because it starts with an extramarital affair today, which broadly speaking, people would say is, you know, probably not nice thing to do. It's really quite a hurtful thing to do. Uh, who sets what is moral and right in your personal life? How far do you take that? It would be so dangerous to go down the social credit system route. Tobias. Yeah, I think some powerful points have been made. We do need to see the full report as to put this into context, I think, as you've alluded to. But I would agree that uh, on just face value, this is a bit of distraction. Let's talk, take away some of the massive challenges that the police are facing at the moment. They've had a very, very difficult year. They play a critical role in our society. Uh, but we need to start addressing some of those those deeper uh, issues that uh, I'm afraid have been uh, um, dominant in the headlines. Over well, the as I say, we will be talking about this in the next hour. Already calls coming in on it. Um, let's do our fun text for the end of the programme, which everybody looks forward to. Jacob Re This is from Jack in Stockport. Jacob Rees-Mogg told Andrew Marr earlier that he's never worn a pair of jeans. What item of clothing would you never wear. I confess I have seen Andrew Marr in a pair of jeans. I have never seen Jacob Rees-Mogg in a pair of jeans. And um, I, I wear jeans even though I am over the age of 50. I should be ashamed of myself, I know. Ava. You look great in a pair of jeans. You've never you seen me in a pair of jeans. You can wear jeans over 50. <laughs> well, of course you can. apparently not. Well, of course you can. That's outrageous. I would just like to con you defy do, convention. You <laughs> um, fur, I would say. That, that, that's a good one. I would say that too, but um, I'm not sure men ever look good in fur. Uh, Shara? I mean, I I like gender-neutral clothing, and jeans would be an, an artefact of that, and I can't ever imagine wearing anything in the women's traditionally repertoire. Only on Saturday nights. I guess one piece of an item which I wouldn't consider wearing is a wig. And I know perhaps both of us are a bit follically challenged, but I think it's nice to actually present exactly as you are. Tobias? I'm going back to the question because I think you could perhaps get Jacob here and invite him to put on a set of jeans for for charity or whatever. He wasn't actually ruling it out. He simply said he hadn't worn them. And I think that that's actually... I, would, I, I would think like we'd have to switch the cameras off at that point, wouldn't well, we? Well, perhaps. <laughs> just but for all, decency all I'm reasons. saying is that it's if somebody who doesn't wear jeans in their lives, I mean, that does say something about Jacob. And I think we can actually relate to knowing a little bit about Jacob. That's probably happened. But it might be a good thing to get him into a pair. Mm, that okay. be a good thing. <laughs> what I would not wear it would be uh, another football shirt other than AFC Bournemouth. I'll put it that in a... Pandering, is to, his, pandering to his constituents there. Kate? Crocs. Crocs. Not no. wearing Crocs. They're great. I'm sure they're comfortable, but I can't bring myself to do they're it. They're plastic, like aren't they? I don't know what they are, but I just don't think they're winners. Sweaty feet. Ugh. No, don't want that. You're not seeing Crocs. What a way to end the programme. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Tobias, Kate, Ava and Shara, good to have you with us. We'll have you all back very, very soon. So in the next hour, we are going to talk about this new police report that says that uh, having, a date, having an extramarital affair might be a red flag in recruitment terms. Have you 
ever heard anything so preposterous. 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, three European leaders have made the hazardous journey to Kyiv in a show of support for Ukraine. Russian airstrikes, which killed five people, have forced the capital into a curve.